What's up, everybody? How you doing? That was Adi Ran, uh, punk rock, breast love, Israeli uh, a musician. I once saw him uh, performing in the Sinai. That that song is Nieti um, Dos. I've I've frummed out, and the, the lyrics are like, "Dad, I've gone, I've I've frummed out. Like I've gotten, I, I I became religious, you know." And that's like, "Mom, I became religious." Yeah. Grandma, I think I frummed out. Um, okay, uh, I want to just start. There was a there was a lot of um, I hear uh, that there was a lot of good news this weekend, um, but there uh, there was some sad news also. Um, uh, one of the great, really um, Jewish voices of our of our time, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, um, uh, passed away um, after. A, a battle with cancer, and uh, he was he he was really I think an inspiration to to Jews all across the the aisle to use you know one of the the terms of our you know current conversation, um, and that you know he was like a, an Orthodox uh, British rabbi, but seemed to be beloved by. Um, you know, Jews of, of all stripes and, and all and, and from all countries. And, and and that was partially because he was such a such a towering intellect and so such an uh, eloquent articulator of the faith, but partially because I think he was really committed to um to 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 tolerance as a as a sort of a principle. Um um, and 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 his writings are, are, are worth taking a look at. The dignity of difference, um, in particular, is is one to one to look at. And that's that's going to be relevant um, for our our, um, our topic today. Um, so, want to de dedicate uh, today's learning to Rabbi Jonathan, so to the memory of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Zatzal, um, Zichronot Tzadik Levracha, and uh, and let's begin with a blessing over uh, Torah study, which ends last Asok B'Divrei Torah. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kidshanu B'Mitzvotav, Tzivanu La'asok B'Divrei Torah. Amen. All right, um, first thing I want to do today is to apologize for the title of this class. Uh, did, did, who, who, see, who usually sees it posted on Facebook before they come? Eh, not everybody, not everybody. All right, some people. I posted it today and I'll um, I'll, I'll put it in uh, now in the, the class and now in the source sheet now in the, in the chat as follows. Um, I, I called the class Relationships Between Religious and Secular Jews. Um, and I use those terms intentionally because they do point to an important um, binary or, di or, or, um, or divide in uh, in our larger conversation, certainly one I think a lot about a lot, um, um, having grown up myself with one parent who was, you would call secular and one parent you would call religious. Um, and in Israel, um, it, those terms feel especially um, a, a, applicable to, uh, to a particular social divide between the, um, between the dati and the chiloni, right? Religious and secular. Translated literally, but I think um, I think that the 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 real translation I should have used um, is a, a, the relationships between observant and non-observant Jews. Okay, that's really what we're talking in a Jewish context. Often, what we're really talking about, and that's true even in in, in Israel, is we're not talking about um, people who have religious sensibilities and people who are I don't know like anti-religious. Uh, we're often talking about people who practice Judaism religiously um, and people whose Judaism uh, m like may be full and rich and even religious, but is um, not as, uh, as commit committed or defined by practice, right? Keeping halacha, right? Shomer mitzvot, um, um, observant. There are a lot of ways to talk about this, but that's, uh, that is on the one hand, um, better terminology to, to map out some of the differences in um, groups in the Jewish community. Um, but uh, but it's sort of, it is sort of technical. 
And even, even getting that technical, we're not really doing these, this conversation justice because it isn't that there are people who are more observant and less observant. There are different kinds of observances and there are people who, well, we speak about it as if we're just talking about a spectrum of, of strictness and leniency. And that's true a, a lot. That's a helpful, another helpful binary to keep in mind. But it's not always true. There are people who are strict about some things and not strict about other things on both ends of the aisle. And you can even define, um, um, you can even define the very same po uh, 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 position or de um, debate uh, in Jewish law um, in two different ways and make e either side sound like the more strict or the more like um, uh, in the in the um, in the question of say um, homosexuality, one of the great you know like great sort of charged topics of our time and whether homosexuality is prohibited by the Torah, you might say, well, I'm very, very strict on, um, on, the, on the prohibition in the Torah. Or you might say, no, no, no I'm very, very strict on, um, on um, regarding human dignity in every person, right? Kavod abriot. Those who argue for um, a permissive, a new standard of permissiveness around um, the place of homosexuality in our community are arguing that we have to take um, the principle of kavod abriot, seriously, we have to be strict about that, right? And then on the other side, they're saying, no, no, we have to take those verses in Leviticus seriously, we have to be strict about that. So all, all of which is to say that the whole thing is a mess. You can't really talk about the religious and the non-religious. You can't even really talk about the observant or the non-observant. You can't even really talk about the strict or the not strict. But having said all that, um, I want all those binaries in the air because they are helpful um, for thinking about some of the dynamics um, that exist within our Jewish community when some people are committed to certain kinds of practice and other people are not. And what does that mean for us as a community? And, and how do we do, how can we coexist, right? Something Rabbi Sachs was, was very um, concerned with. So I want us to think about that in, in the Jewish context, but I also want us to, in these days, my God, I want us to think about it um, in a larger, in a national context. Like how do different groups with fundamentally different beliefs and commitments um, and levels of, um, of even um, practice, the, uh, how do we all exist together or do we not? Do we have to retreat from one another and you, you, know, you stay on your side of the street and I'll stay on, on mine? And what's lost in that in that calculation? Okay, so um, in order to do that, um, we're going to look at, um, as we do in this class, the Mishnah, the Mishnah in Masechet Demai. Okay, Demai is the is the is the name of the Masechet. It's the third uh, tractate of the Mishnah, and Demai is. I'm just going to explain it. It, because I, I, don't, I don't think we, uh, we need to take our time like learning what it is. I'm just going to explain it. And then we're going to get into the way it plays out in the community. And then we'll start to um, talk about it and analyze. So demai is um, a term um, that, well, first of all, first of all, before I, I tell you what demai is, um, well, I'll define it as produce, which is in doubt. Okay, but that doesn't make any sense. Demai means like doubt. But um, the produce is in doubt because of, because of tithing, okay? So there are tithing systems in ancient Jewish law. There's the, the, the tithe, the truma, which you give to the, to the priest, right? Take off of that. That's still, that practice still, um, still um, exists in, uh, in, in our, our day in taking challah um, off of the bread, right? As a kind of a donation to the, to the priest. So truma is... Um, of your produce, taking some of that and donating it to the priest. That's one tithe. Then there's Maser Rishon, the first, the first tithe after Truma. And that's for not just the priest, but the whole Levite uh, tribe. The Levite tribe who work in service of the people at the temple. Everybody else presumably is, you know, agriculture or business, but the Levites um, mind to the holy services of the community and there's a tithe for them. Then, okay, then there's Maser Shani, the second tithe. And this second tithe is complicated, goes to different places in different years. But one of the places that it goes is to the poor, 
and it's called it's often called the poor man's tithe or maser ani. Okay, now there was so that that's that's um, that's the tithing system. Th there was at at some point in, during the rabbinic period um, or pre-rabbinic period um, because the uh, the um, there was well I'll just I'll just say it simply there was a um, a sense that people were not taking the second tithe seriously. They would tithe the first tithe and because they knew that was really serious and the under, it was, you know, the Torah speaks about it under penalty of death. They, they would do that, but they wouldn't tithe the second tithe, okay? And that tithe, you know, before we, you know, whisk our hands, oh my God, the second tithe, and I was so worried about that, like to that point, really, you're so concerned. The second tithe, remember, is the poor man's tithe, right? So, so there's a concern that they weren't doing that, but here's the problem. You cannot eat produce unless it's been tithed, properly tithed. You cannot eat produce unless it's been taxed or do, the, the donation has been given. And so, demai refers to produce that um, you don't know whether or not it's been properly tithed because the person selling you the produce or the person who owns the produce is not someone that you consider to, to be serious about tithing, okay? And the word for that kind of person, it becomes a very big, important phrase that we're gonna think a lot about today, is an am ha'aretz. Literally, people of the land. You might say salt of the earth, right? And it does have that connotation, but it also has the connotation of like the uneducated, the ignorant, the hoi poloi, the am ha'aretz, okay? And um, that this is, uh, as we introduce that category, we've already done something, or the rabbis have already done something really uh, radical that we have to now spend our time processing. What does it mean to officially begin to designate a category of people as not trustworthy? Not trustworthy because they are known not to take certain things seriously that you, you take seriously. Right, and if this is hard to relate to, um, I, I don't want to make this equivalency uh, absolute, but I'm sure, like we can, uh, we can, we can surely tap into what it's like to have different standards of taking something seriously that affects other people in this time of the coronavirus. Right, we all have a sense that there are different standards that people are keeping, and you're a little nervous about someone else's standards, and to you it matters. And of course we can begin to say, well, it's very different. We talk about religious, blah, 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 blah. You can, we'll talk about that, but at least tr let's try to tap into the mindset of rabbis who were coming up with this um, system for uh, being careful about um, not consuming produce, which, was, which they considered forbidden to them, okay? Which to them was like trafe because it hadn't been properly tied. Okay, all right, that's a lot of information. I'm sorry, but you need it as we head in. Any questions so far before we begin to actually look at material? Okay, all right, so let's go. We're gonna take a look um, and, and even as we start here, you're gonna see that we're, we're talking about um, very, um, very uh, deep things, very profound questions like who what does it mean to be trustworthy? What does it mean to be trustworthy? Okay, so let's take a look now at, uh, at our first text in Masechet Damai. Okay, those who take it upon themselves to be trustworthy, ne'eman, ne'eman, must tithe whatever they eat and whatever they sell and whatever they buy and they may not be the guest of an am ha'aretz. Okay, let's, let's just, so one who, uh, who now first, first of all, the first question I want to ask is, what is it, why would you take it upon, why do you, what does it mean? I want to now take it upon myself to be trustworthy. Why would you do that? What's going on here? What is the thing that you are taking upon yourself? Or what is the motivation of this person? Who wants to be considered trustworthy? Um, yeah, El. It's 
uh, resonating with me as Dalif Memieta Omed. Know before whom you stand. This is a person that you can trust even when no one's looking. And okay. so this, this person is buying into that, saying, I'm that person. I'm, okay. I'm in, yeah. So one, one way of looking at this is this is like, this is a big thing. It's not specific. It's a big thing. It's about character. This person wants to be a trustworthy, a believable a person you can have, you can have faith in. And it happens that the standard in this society is to follow all the rules. So I want to be a, I want to be a trustworthy, I want to be someone that, you know, you know, this, this, this guy does the right thing. Okay, what, what are other motivations? Any, any other motivations we want to throw out there for a person who wants to be considered trustworthy? Yeah, Ken. Well, I mean, there's an economic uh, aspect too, because if you are known to be trustworthy, people will be more likely to deal with you as opposed to someone, some Johnny come lately, if you will, who they don't know. Great. Great. Okay, good. This is the other side of it. And I think we could look at this calculation idealistically or uh, pra practically, even cynically, which is that part of what it means to be trustworthy is to have people um, eat, eat, eat it in your kitchen and buy your, your food, right? And the, that's why how people are making living. They're selling food. What if there's a group of people, you know, like wink, wink, keep kosher, you know, like think about like all the kosher standards that, that exist now. What if there's a group of people who won't eat at your place because you're not, your, your kosher is not considered good enough? Well, that you're going to lose business. So you might want to be considered trustworthy because you care about being a trustworthy person. You might want to be considered trustworthy because that's how you want to be fully accepted in this society by everyone. You want to, you want to be the gold standard. Okay. Peter, did I see you? Um, uh, it, it's sort of what you what you just said. Somebody who wants to rise to be considered a leader. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. And this this consideration, this idea that someone has a desire to, for a certain kind of status in the society, we're going to con continue to push on that. But I think that's good enough for now. Um, Yoni, do you have a, a comment or a question? Yeah, I just have a quick, very quick story to share that relates to this. Um, I was. Uh, on the Caribbean island last year in St. Martin. And there's a lot of stores, only jewelry stores owned by Israelis that you know it is because there's a mezuzah. And what we discovered is that there were also a lot of jewelry stores owned by Indian people. And they put up mezuzahs as like a demarcation to kind of convince people, look, we're also trustworthy. We have the sign of like someone who follows the rules. And it's a little bit of a bait and switch, but it's just kind of an interesting way that proving your religiousness, even if it's not yours, makes people, you know, as a business method. Yeah, right, right. Okay, so we see that that's like, uh, there, there's, there can be like a kind of a scheming to this, that it actually can be good for you to be considered from. Okay, so, um, so, uh, that, so, so that, that takes us then to how you end up cons being considered Ne'eman, okay? So, um, those who take it upon themselves to be Neman, they have to tithe whatever they eat and sell and buy, and that's fine. But then they also cannot be the guest of an Am Haaretz, okay? They also cannot be, um, um, uh, eat at an Am Haaretz's house. Why? It seems kind of, classist doesn't it good okay so that's so yeah right so th this is this is the issue i mean what you're saying lorelei is is the problem right like we're starting to get to the cost of this sort of standard which is that now you can't fully interact with other people and it seems classist, it seems exclusionary. It seems, there's a lot, we can begin to pile on. What, what is the feeling here of uh, this, this interaction? To, for someone to say, I can't, I can no longer eat at your house. And again, it's not, we're talking tithes, but it's very easy for us to imagine this in the, in the realm of, of kashrut, of keeping kosher, right? Okay, um, Elizabeth. Um, 
But really, when you think about it, that's the whole reason of all of these things is to keep a group separate from other people. If you can't break bread together, you're not going to fall in love and get married and whatever. But, you know, wh whoever Lorelai, I think, said about, about the feeling of being held separate, I mean, just from a personal point of view, um, my son who lives in Israel, um, during Pesach, his children are not allowed to eat at their grandparents' home at all. And it is very offensive to those grandparents who are Israelis and who, and who do keep kosher, but it's not kosher enough. And every Passover gets this uh, bad taste because my son will not let his children eat at the grandparents' home. And, you know, that's, that's where he draws the line. And it's a slippery slope for everybody who keeps these rules, but it is the way to keep people separate. So. Okay, so Elizabeth is saying something important and, and provocative, um, which is that maybe the point of this is to keep you away from the hoi polloi. <laughs> like maybe it isn't just, maybe we don't take um, at face value the idea, oh, I'm just so worried about eating this. Maybe you didn't tithe your food. Maybe the idea is, is a good way. Remember, the my is not a category in the Torah, Demai is something the rabbis came up with. So Elizabeth suggests that, you know, on the one hand, you understand where people are coming from. Like I, I have standards for keeping kosher. I want to keep kosher. But on the other hand, um, you want, first of all, the social cost is tremendous. The potential for, for real damage in, in close relationships, because as Elizabeth says, you can be um, trusted and your family can be not trusted, right? And so, but the idea that maybe the rabbis are actually scheming to keep uh, keep the, the the people together, keep the observant people together, right? So, um, so okay. So that there's there's a lot to, to think about there. I see a lot of hands up. Let's take some hands. I'll take uh, Alexandra Payam and Yonatan, and then we'll try and see what what comes next. Alexandra, I have a question and a a comment. Um, my question is, when was this written and like, what was the historical context and what were the rabbis dealing with at the time? Because how I feel about so much of the rabbis work is I'm grateful on one hand that they like preserved our religion, but on the other hand, it was at such a cost and such an imprisoning cost, especially when it's used today to the letter. Um, so I'm just curious what was the historical context of this and did they need to sort of threaten people in order to like preserve Jews in an unfriendly world at the time? Okay, you you said it, Alexander. I mean, you said it so well. I think that that's, you, you gave us uh, exactly the right or at least one important framework for thinking about this. These were people who, um, the, the Mishnah is being written after the destruction of the great temple in Jerusalem. These were people who, were indeed worried that Judaism was going to simply like dissolve. There was no hope. And the only thing that they had was their ability to preserve the traditions. And they were worried. And that period is one that we um, often use to think about modernity and what it's like to enter into modernity and to suddenly feel like the entire social organization of Judaism has been restructured and you're worried that Judaism's not going to survive and people are leaving and precisely leaving because they're no longer faithful to the law, right? And so, you know, even as, as Alexandra says, this is so, so distasteful, so destructive. Is it even worth it? She does give us a pretty, um, if not sympathetic, at least like uh, understanding um, account of what it, why someone might say, listen, we don't have any choice here. Look, the religion's gonna just like fade away if we don't do this. I'm not saying that is the motivation, but it might be. Payam? I think it's interesting you talk about trust, but I mean, I think like rabbis don't trust anybody. You know, it sounds like if I trusted someone then I would let them go into anybody's house and do whatever, like, because I trust their moral and ethical framework you know like I think it's and I think it's like they have you know what the rabbis the issue with all this is they have 
questions about their own moral system they've created because it's based not on grace or love in essence it's based on like all these rules and they sort of don't trust themselves with the system they created so it's like well let's just try to keep a much distance to preserve this system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great th th good another way of thinking about the rabbinic mind is just that they're obsessed with details and rules and that may sound you know like 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 a unappealing religious um, paradigm for you but but that's that was true for them and they really felt like it, it is so important to just make sure that you do everything right i suspect myself i suspect you i just have to be sure right pesach thinking right passover thinking just like ah there might be a crumb there and maybe that's it maybe it's not a kind of um, a system that's being designed for social control and to make but just people freaked out about eating the wrong thing Okay, um, and Yonatan. I, Yonatan, I think it's important to acknowledge, uh, you can't see me, no, not okay. today. All right. Um, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that values are not inherently right or wrong. And things that were profoundly important to the people who wrote these texts and to a lot of Jews today, um, I, I think it's fair to say in this crowd, in the Ikar crowd, we understand them, but we don't necessarily share them. Um, so, so I think the value of making a statement like "you can't eat in in the in the house of an amharitz" um, to understand that you have to understand that these people really cared about tithing. Like it was important to them to only eat food that had been tithed, and sort of an equivalent to that for me that I think would resonate more with this crowd is I'm a vegetarian. I'm a strict vegetarian, and there are people and there are places that I will not eat because I don't trust that the, the strictures are high enough that what I'm eating would actually be vegetarian, right? So without any judgment toward that host, without any sense of superiority or classism, I wouldn't feel morally comfortable eating food that was not appropriately supervised. Okay. Okay, there you go. And... You know, I'd ask everyone to do what Yonatan is doing, which is to try to imagine some standard that you have. Maybe it's your coronavirus practice, or maybe it's your some eating practice, or maybe it's professionalism, or maybe it's um, the way you speak. Some practice that you have that you really care about and that, you know, it actually kind of would matter if somebody else around you wasn't behaving in that way. It would actually matter. Okay, all right, um, let's, so th with that, with the stage set there, um, let's continue on in our um, exploration of how this, how this plays out. Um, I think we're, we're, we're already late, so I think I'm gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna take too much time here to analyze this, but, um, but look at this, uh, just, I'll read through and just sort of speak it out a little bit myself. Look at this um, discussion that takes place afterwards where, where Rabbi Judah says, even one who is the guest of an Hanama Aretz can still be considered trustworthy. So don't think that it was a straightforward up, open and shut case. Here's a rabbi who says, whoa, 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 whoa. You can still, you can eat at other people's houses, but still be considered to serve kosher food yourself, right? And then they say to him, he's not trustworthy with himself. How can he be considered trustworthy with others, right? I had this um, rabbi who used to say, um, you know, uh, when he'd hear about, it's kind of snotty, but this whole discussion is kind of snotty. I had this rabbi who used to say that about people that would like keep a kosher home, but eat in non-kosher restaurants. Like, oh, so you keep kosher in your kitchen, but not in your stomach, you know, right? That kind of attitude is the attitude they're coming with at the end. Like, come on, if that, if that person, and I, like, there's a, there's a psychology here. You know, what does it mean that you don't really take it seriously because you will eat food that hasn't been tithed? So, on so even though, I mean, we can imagine someone says, no, no, but in my own business, I'll do it I'll, and I'll do it for you. But we, we don't, the rabbis say, believe that you will keep a kosher, I keep using kosher, it's just easier, but a tithed, um, um, market if you're willing to eat untithed food. 
right? Why is that? What, why don't we believe that someone could manage that? Like I, my business is, is, is kosher, but I will eat, I will personally eat anywhere. Wendy, do you, are you able to, to explain that? Uh, we can hear you. Oh, I, I actually, I, I, I question this. I, I have a very difficult time with, with this because um, we're dealing with practices in life and we're, we're defining it as black and white. And life and living is not black and white. If there isn't an absolute. I think rules are there absolutely for good reasons. But when we take things to extremes, which this is an absolute extremism, there's a danger because then you're not taking into, uh, um, court, you're not taking humanism humanity into into uh your your thoughts okay okay that's my, that's what my... yeah no i mean i i hear the argument against but w why might the rabbi say you I, can't I, yeah i think it's i think it comes from a place at what you were talking about earlier it comes from a place of fear if we don't keep these fences up and we use that that uh, uh analogy of fences are very important. We've talked about it in various ways, how we speak, how we do things to guard. We must guard certain things. Right, right, and, okay. And the question oh, is, what are, what are we afraid of? What are we afraid of? And, is, and we've sort of, we've kicked this around before. Um, um, you know, are we afraid of actually consuming the wrong thing? Are we afraid of just like the religion fading? Are we afraid of, um, of you know, co-mingling with those who are not taking it as seriously. But, um, but that all of that doesn't, th th those things can be true, um, but all of that doesn't tell us what is, what is it, what's the psychological principle that says if someone eats non-kosher food, they will serve, their, their service to you is questionable. Why is that? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm belaboring the point. Maybe it's just, I'll, I'll give my, my answer, which is that that person at the end of the day doesn't take it seriously. They will sell you kosher food, but not if like something drops, it, you're, drops into the wrong pot and you're gonna lose a hundred dollars because it just, ah, it's not actually real. It's not actually real. So I'm not gonna, at this point, like I'll just take it back in and, and they, and you don't, you won't know any better, right? So it's like, you imagine the, call this anxiety or fear, it might be, but you can imagine the brain that is processing this, okay? All right, let's, um, let's now take it, ramp it up, right? You're already uncomfortable. Let's make you more uncomfortable, okay? Um, so far, we've been talking about just being someone who's trustworthy on the practice of tithing, okay? Now we're gonna look at a new, we're, we're, we're gonna introduce here a new term, okay? And the term is a chaver, a chaver, which, you know, literally in Hebrew means friend, a friend. But the way it's being used here, it's clear. It doesn't just mean your pal. Okay, let's take a look. So remember, someone takes it upon themselves to be trustworthy. That's what they got to do. They got to tithe in, in the right way. And that's the concern. That's what demise all about. Da, 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 da. Someone who takes it upon himself to become a chaver, which you might translate as friend, you might, I th you know, you might translate as a, a fellow, you know, I, I think that might be a useful translation, but let's just see. One who takes upon himself to become a chaver may not sell to an am ha'aretz either wet or dry produce, nor buy from him wet produce, nor be the guest of an am ha'aretz, nor host an am ha'aretz as a guest while he is wearing his cloak. Okay, if you didn't, if you did understand that, I'm like, what? <laughs> I can't believe you understood that. So does anyone have any idea? I'm just going to tell you, but does anyone have any idea? Like what's, a, now, if you were, wanted to be trustworthy, you would do all this tithing. But if you want to be a chaver, then it's like, there's other stuff. Anyone know what's going on here? Anyone have any clue? I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, yeah, yeah. If you're like, tell me. Yeah, Al, you know? Well, I don't know if I know. When you have a kippah on, that then that means you are dealing in trustworthy ways. I'm imagining people with kippot in the in the shuk at Machane Yehuda. 
Mm. And it's interesting how what you're, I'm really resonating. It, when I first became observant, I was at, um, at, at a small yeshiva in Jerusalem and I didn't know anything. So this was five days before Tisha B'Av. We went downstairs to the little makolet and they sold us meat because they could get away with it. Mm. And we went upstairs and our teacher says, you can't eat meat. It's in the week before Tisha B'Av. And these people were wearing a black kippah. Mm -hmm. But they, this, I think this has to do with what you're talking about. When you're wearing a kippah, this is saying who you are, who you deal with. And you don't, you don't, you, this is a semel. Okay. 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 I, 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 I I, I, I think it's interesting to think about how people might be designated or marked as a believable person. But I don't think we're, I don't think there's any kind of, in this case, I don't think there's any recognizable, um, like a kippah. Um, but there isn't, there's a status. You become a fellow, you can become one of the friends, right? Like think about the, the society of friends, you know, like sort of Quaker language, right? Like, how is it that you could become considered as a friend? And then the, all this stuff about wet and dry produce, right? We've been talking about tithing. So that, the, there's a question about how you can be trusted on the particular act of tithing. But then, then um, we, we are given new laws and these laws are not about tithing, but about purity, tuma. And that's a whole separate category of 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 law um tithing is yeah, obviously taking food out of of the produce and donating it and has aspects of it to that we can relate to right like you use the tithe to feed people who need food tuma is different and the reason they're like, talking about like wet and dry produce is because wet produce um, when something's wet it can contract tuma it can contract impurity and that's important because you can't eat impurity if you ever want to go into the temple or near the temple to offer a sacrifice. Uh, even as I speak it out, it's like, oh, I could keep, uh, oh, and explain that and explain that. And explain. We're in really deep technicalities here and I actually don't want to spend time talking about all of the ins and outs of, oh, well, if the Ama Aretz comes um, in and has a garment on and the garment could have contracted Tuma and so there were, but you can see like now it's, there's another, a new level, a higher level and it's called the Haber, the friend. Now, this friend, this chaver, this is a term that's going to come up in the Mishnah again and again, and it's um, it is above above um, above all. Um, the best way to think of it is it's the beginning of what we think of as the rabbis. The rabbis were the people who could trust one another in everything, right? They were oh, that's a chaver. That's a person who takes the law seriously. Right? What does it mean to become, to be considered as someone who's one of the friends, one of the, the in circle, one of the group who can be trusted, not just on this practice that like now there's a conversation around, you know, who's going to tithe and who's considered trustworthy around tithe, but just in general, this is a, this person's, um, dare I say, Judaism, I can, I can rely on. Okay? That's a, whoo. Like we're, we're now, we've developed a category, a, a class. Someone said class earlier. We've developed a class of people, okay? And just note that the rabbis are the Pharisees. The Pharisees means the Prushim. The Prushim were those who were separate. They separated themselves. And we're seeing, where does that language come from separating? We're seeing that right here. They separate themselves to be very far from impurity or any contact with anyone who might have impurity. If this sounds like religious extremism to you, you're right. <laughs> you're right. It's extreme. It's pretty extreme. These are also the people who developed the Judaism that we, that we practice today, right? Like these are the people that we owe everything to, but yes, they started in this, as they, as they were in this, for this moment that is some, as, as, uh, as Elizabeth asked before, like pointed out, like this is a very fragile moment for them. And they're creating a class of people that are the friends, the friends who can be trusted. Okay. Okay. Uh, I see some hands up. So I want to take just some, some comments before we 
we, we plunge further. I want to actually make sure that we get to the last Mishnah because it's one of the coolest um, in the in the in the in the Mishnah. But we'll we'll get there. A Allison, um, I'll keep this short. But I think what's really interesting, like just when you say Pharisees, is it just reminds me so much of Jesus and the New Testament. And you know, we've been wrestling with this aspect of Judaism the whole class. But I would say. Like for myself, I really wrestle with the aspects of Judaism that can seem harsh or exclusionary um, and where we kind of like we reject people all the time, uh, even people who consider themselves Jews. And, you know, it's like families where it's like my cash root is stronger than your cash root. So therefore we can't have dinner together. Um, and it's just so interesting to me. It feels like yeah, I'm not Christian, but I, I kind of understand why maybe there was some sort of a need for someone to push back against this really rigid form of religion that feels like laws without heart. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's continue here. Th thoughts on this because uh, Allison has articulated very, very well. A lot of what feels, especially in this age, you know, where we are, are kind of awakening to the, to the notion that, that so many people are, are excluded and, and marginalized in, in, in the social order, right? We're sensitized to that. And then we realize that Judaism itself is, 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 is a kind of a, uh, a distinction, a kind of an in-group. Uh, it's a weird thing, right? This, uh, for me, this is a very a dif a difficult conversation to, have, to know how to have, because on the one hand, Jews feel like the ultimate outsiders, right? But on the other hand, they have all their own little insider, outsider stuff. And they're also, in being the outsiders, the insiders. And a lot of what's happening here in these Mishnayot is the defining of, well, who's in? Who is in? And the standards that the rabbis are using is those who, who keep the law, those who keep the tradition. And so what, what else could there be? Okay. Um, Payam. Can a chaver be a third-party group? I mean, to me, it sounds like a group that's not part of the discussion or argument or whatever between group A and group B. And group A is applying to like these third-party people who are outside of their war. And it's like, well, if you want to be a friend to us, then don't sell to group B. And here's the stuff you shouldn't, you shouldn't sell to group B. So you look at like economic systems, right? right. There's always like farmers make X. And, you know, so there's stuff they always have to buy from outside sources. So they're talking to like a mercantile class or something. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've sort of considered this before and I don't know, I, I think it's worth keeping on the, on, it, like in the discussion, this idea that there's a kind of a cabal, right? A kind of, which is an anti-Semitic word, um, a kind of a, 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 you know, a building of a social network that is, these are like, yeah, there's a religious practice, but it's a way of like creating economic ties and social ties and just like fortifying this group. How much is that? Is that a part of it? Um, Ken? I think the history is important to understand. At this time, with the destruction of the Second Temple, the whole world of Judaism was thrown upside down. Yeah, I, I can't imagine a more symbolic, and deeply felt uh, crisis than that, because the whole structure of what had been Judaism is now overthrown. Then come the Pharisees, and there are many other groups. There was the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the and, and others, all vying for, I don't want to say PR, but a following or had a following. And the Pharisees were the winners. And if you understand the period in which this is being developed, I can understand this very, very uh, easily, how they would have this view, especially since they were then conquered by the Romans, who were a, a real external force. Uh, now, of course, what happens over the course of Jewish, of eventual Jewish history is, interestingly enough, a greater segmentation of the religious system. Yeah. But, but I can understand how this starts. The real question is, 
should we be following something from the first to the third centuries BC of, uh, of the common era? Right. In the, 20, in the 21st century. I'd leave it that. Great. That, that very, 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 very deep thoughts from, from Ken there. I mean, you know, I'm, so first of all, thank you. I'll just, I'll just re-articulate th that we've, we've already, um, we've already discussed the fragility of the moment they were in with respect to um, preserving Judaism. But also, I mean, Ken's description made me think, gosh, it is a, also a time when, you know, nobody really knew who to trust. You know, there was a, like, it was, it was a, it's a, it was a fragile time socially, you know, like the, there's a new um, regime, an ab, of, of sort of an absolute power, right? There's the Romans, and then there are Jews who are more faithful to the Romans, right? And there are Jews who are sort of, assimilating. There are Jews who have different, who are less faithful to the Romans, who are, they're, they're zealous and they, what they, they're, they wanted to rebel um, and, and create a military conflict. There's like all kinds of factions and imagine what it's like to be like, who do I, who can I just sort of build my society with when it's chaos all around me, right? But then can ask like the important question, which is, okay, so maybe we can understand where the rabbis were coming from, but how much of this needs to be deconstructed? Okay, on that note, let me share with you, we're going to jump a couple of chapters. I want to share with you um, um, one of my favorite uh, twists in Masechet Damai, which is that for all of the discomfort here that, that's been expressed around these exclusionary systems, look at how the rabbis themselves felt uncomfortable with it and a kind of a beautiful little moment, though you know, you may not you may not find it as charming as I do, so we'll we'll see. But um, but later on in the tractate, it says that one who vowed to have his friend eat with him. Now, the use of the language of vowing here is a little complicated, but I think for our purposes, let's just say that this person's like, I swear you got to eat with me. You know, you just like I I'm 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 pledging upon you that you have to have a meal with me. But the friend does not trust him with tithes, okay? So it's a it's like a chaver and an amaretz, right? It's a rabbi and then a, a salt of the earth type. <laughs> but the salt of the earth type is saying, "I want I you were friends. Let's eat together. I you must eat with me. I I I implore you. I I, I pledge upon you to eat with me." It says then he may eat with him on the first Shabbat even though he does not generally trust him with tithes, provided that his friend had said to him that the food has been tithed. But on the second Shabbat, even if he has vowed, the chaver may not eat with him unless he first tithes the produce. Okay? So what's the law here? If someone is not trustworthy, you wouldn't buy from them, you wouldn't eat in their house, but they really, they beg you, they implore you, they beseech you to have a meal with them, you can have a, one Shabbat. You get one Shabbat with them. What a strange law. What a strange law. And, and I got to say, I kind of, I, lo I love it. I like it. This idea that anyone, and, and, and it's not, it's not free. They have to say, oh, I have tithe. Don't worry. My house is kosher. Right. But if they just say that, you don't have to wonder, oh, but I saw you eating at McDonald's. No, one Shabbat you get. The second Shabbat, though, you can't keep doing that because ultimately there's a, there's a reality here that you're trying to, but one Shabbat you get. Now, I kind of like that, but I wonder what you all think of that. Do you, do, is, this, is, this, is this a moment of, of the rabbinic heart softening or what, what, how, do you, how do you read this? Uh, Yonatan's got a hand up. I, I mean, <clears throat> I'm going to speak on the side of the rabbis again, which I sometimes can't believe I do. But um, I think this is evidence that these laws are not intended to be exclusionary, that there's a set of values. They understand that there's a tension between the value of kashrut and the value of shlom Israel um, or, or some version of, you know, people, people being in society together. I think fundamentally these, these laws, I mean, and I, I've seen a lot of the heard a lot of language here about you know exclusionary and, and antiquated 
rules, and, and maybe they are a little bit, but I, I mostly feel that they're, there's some formulation of a common project, right, that we are, as Jews, intended to build together. And as often as not, I've found that, they, that the laws of Kashrut uh, and comparable religious observance build community rather than um, excluding people from one another if there's a common understanding within a community of observing them. So back when I lived in Nashville and there were very few people in town who observed Kashrut at all, um, and a family came for a sabbatical that uh, was very strict about it, and I kept a kosher set of dishes, not a whole kosher kitchen, um, the fact that they knew that they could rely on me for kosher meals made for strong community interactions that would not have happened without that rule. I think, yeah, so that uh, all this by way of saying, I think these rules are designed amongst other things to create community, Good. purposeful and holy community. Good. So uh, uh, along with that, you're right, like it's a very, very sympathetic to the rabbis and I appreciate that because it is, it's easy all these years later to jump on what, what seems to us antiquated, but but first of all, a very vivid and, and, and helpful description of what it is that, that the rabbis might have had in mind. What were they seeking? What kind of community were they trying to build? But, um, says Yonatan, and I think um, import, importantly, um, this, is, I, this is really a moment where the rabbis are at least struggling a little bit with, but we don't want to not be able to eat with people, right? Like, do we really want to, like, our friends are our neighbors, our fellow Jews, and they want it like, and they're like, come on, I want to eat with you, I love, you know, and by the way, we're not just talking about people who reject the religion or um, necessarily or suspect in any way, it just might be someone who just doesn't know the practice and, and is saying, oh, no, no, I made my kitchen kosher for you, but you don't know, uh, you don't even know what kosher is. Again, I saw you eating McDonald's. But you know what? I can trust you just this once because I have to have one Shabbat with you. Now, I'm not sure this is a great rule. Like, what happens then the next week? You're like, okay, well, we used our Shabbat. But, like, there's something here that I think is, is at least an acknowledgement. And Yonatan hears the rabbis acknowledging that, you know, the, the rabbis are trying here to find, like, there's, it's not that they're unaware of the tension that, that we're identifying. Okay, um, let's see. I'm gonna take two voices we haven't heard from, and then we'll look at the last Mishnah. Um, I think we have time for that. Agnes. I think um, it's, I feel like we've been talking about this in terms of the values that it reflects about our relationships with each other. And I also think it reflects values about our relationship with these rules. And that, like I think about my own long and back and forth, many slow journey of Shabbat practice and how like some weeks I'll make this exception, other weeks I don't make this exception or, and it, and it brings friction into life. It's like, I can't cover my coworker at the bookstore. I can't pick up my friend at the airport or I, you know, but I really do think that it's not, when I have a Shabbat with compromises A, B and C, it's not the same Shabbat. And I think that in this moment when the rabbis are transitioning from a religion where there is sacrifice and blood and actual animals to this religion, which is seems so much more symbolic, how do you, like, I think we sort of assume that all these rules are symbolic, but, but what if there, there is actually some divine cosmic order to them? What if like a Shabbat observed this way is not actually a Shabbat in the way that this observed Shabbat is? Or what if like fruit that hasn't been tied is, is actually not fit for food? You know, like there's, I think there's a way in which it's also changing our sense of how the, the, trustworthy, the trustworthiness is a standard because if you take these rules seriously, it's... Um, I'm starting to lose my thread, but I think it's, it's, it's not just about like creating divides and ass, uh, asserting relationships within the community. It's also about asserting the sort of like ontological base of what these rules mean, that they're not just sort of a symbol that like you get the spirit of it and you do that. It's also, this is a different, this apple is a different apple from this apple, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Agnes, you're such an incredibly nuanced thinker. I so, I so appreciate that. I, I, I think, you know, just to build a little bit on, on, on what you already said with, with, with such su subtlety, uh, you know, it, 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 this is a conceptual, this is a conceptual world that is being built. Like to, to have a religion that operates along the, these laws, practices, it's not a temple, it's not a, a sacrifice, there's no smoke. Now everything's sort of 
<laughs> it's like metaphysical. It's just, it's a way of perceiving reality. That's a hard, you know, so what does it mean, as Agnes asks, to really be in Shabbat? What does that mean? Well, you have to create, you have to kind of create that. And in order, and that takes, that's a delicate operation, right? That's like, takes a lot to actually live in a, in a, in a new um, ontology, in a new reality. That's like the product of the concepts and the laws and the practices. And if some people around are like, ah, it's not a big deal. It's, you know what I mean? Just, you know, put a little extra in the pot. You'll be fine. Like you're not in the reality anymore. Yeah, just so beautifully put. Thank you. Um, Alana. Um, so one of the things that comes to mind is kind of like, if you're keeping these laws, you're like believing that you're living your life in the holiest way and the way that you would probably want other people in your life who you think should be living this way to live. And I wonder if any part of it is like, well, if you just completely silo yourself off and you're like, no, we're never having a meal together. How can you like get through to this person versus if you can see them once every so often and they're like, what about next week? And they're like, well, if you do X, Y, and Z, then sure we can do this every, like, I wonder if that, that plays into it at all. Sorry to be all like conspiracy theorists. No, fascinating question, fascinating question. Like this is, imagine this is, this Mishnah was written by like the, what they call the Kiruv rabbi, the, the outreach rabbi, the one who's like, wait, 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 we can't just totally wall ourselves off. We have to like, we have to make a, you know, a connection that's enough so that we can actually but there's a, you know, there, there's a conspiratorial version of that, but there's a, there's a, there's a beauty to that as well, which is we have to create a space where someone can like, we can't totally wall ourselves off. They were sensitive to the idea that if only for the, no, for the somewhat paternalistic notion that someone else should be practicing as you are practicing, if only for that reason, still we have to leave a channel, a window. And I'd like to think that it's deeper than that, that it actually, it's still, it's about Klai Yisrael, right? I mean, Yonatan used earlier like this idea of Shlom Israel, the peace in Israel. And that is the way the Talmud speaks about this, is that it's because it's for, for Darche Shalom, for the ways of peace. We have to live, again, remember the, the, the question at the outset um, that I posed around like um, the, the prohibitions against homosexual sex, right? Like, yeah, okay, they're there in the Torah, but what about the principle of like human dignity, right? Like, there's, there are a value deeply held ethical values that are in the tradition that sometimes conflict with the ritual practice or the strict observance of the law. And we don't just, even the rabbis weren't like just pure legalists. Oh, what can you do? It's just in, it's in the constitution. That's all there is to it. You know, it's not that, it's deeper than that. Okay, one last mission I want us to see, just a very cool, you know, we're gonna like, we'll kind of leave the, the, the politics of the rabbis and the, Chaverim and the Ame Ha'aretz ha behind, this, these sort of classes we've been looking at, and just pan back for a minute to look at what I think is just in isolation and incredibly, this is like what the mission is all about, is these sort of case scenarios that, that reflect on what, is, what does it really mean to trust somebody? Okay, so we'll just look at one last big picture question about trustworthiness. Someone enters a city right here and doesn't know anyone. So they say, who here is trustworthy? Who gives tithes? One person responds, I am. That person may not be trusted. But if that person replied, so-and-so is trustworthy, then so-and-so may be trusted. Okay? So first principle, you're, you're like a chaver. You want to like find who are you, but now you're in for, a, like foreign space. And you want to, who, so who, are there any other chaverim here? If someone says, I am, I am, I'm a, I'm a Pharisee. Yep, we're no problem. You can't trust them. But if someone says, oh, you know, Agnes is a Pharisee. Oh, okay. Then you can trust Agnes, right? That, so what's the principle there? And just to like, just to give it another, uh, another kind of complexity. If they went then, uh, if they then went to buy from so-and-so and ask so-and-so, like you, you can now trust so-and-so. So you go and you ask so-and-so, Say, who, I have another question. Who here sells aged produce? Another agricultural law where you can't eat produce until it's past the, this point in the year, blah, 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 blah. Again, we're not getting too deep into the details right now, but yashan, aged produce. Where can I find some aged produce? And so-and-so says, oh, you know who sells aged produce? The person who sent you to buy stuff from me. And it's as though they appear to be repaying each other. 
Like, do they have some sort of deal? Nevertheless, they may be trusted. So we're, we're, we're just about at time here, but just one last question. What, what is this? What is going on here? What is the idea that you, when you look for trustworthy people, you, someone who vouches for themselves can't be trusted, but, but anyone who vouches for anyone else, the, uh, the other person can be trusted. Anyone got a kind of a read on that? Anyone want to sort of reflect on what's the psychology there? Um, Allison. It never really rings true when you say, I'm a good person, <laughs> you know? Good. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's just, maybe it's just that simple. Like, you can't say, nobody's trusted to say like, oh, I keep the highest standard, right? But that's actually a deep thing to say. Nobody can really vouch for themselves of, I'm the most religious. Oh my gosh, I'm so, I'm perfect in my religiosity. That's, that just, that just sounds like, no, you're not. You don't, you sound like a jerk. You don't sound religious. Jane, do you want to offer any other take on this? No. Okay. Um, but then what, so then what? This, this is really last question. Okay, nobody's believed on that, but what, why do you believe people about other people? If I say, Allison, Allison's a real Javier, then, then, then we know she is. Why? Why? Allison, do you want to take that up as well? Sure. I mean, it's just, it feels more reliable, you know? It, but why? It, because somebody else, like an outsider, probably knows a lot of people, right? Like, you know, maybe a hundred people. And so if you say that I'm like trustworthy or whatever, then you've, you've made an evaluation. You've discerned something. And also... Okay have to gain from it. I think it's interesting that the rabbis sort of address that, the question of what could be, like what kind of personal motivation might there be mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, that suggests that they're thinking, okay, maybe there's there's not so much of a personal motivation to say, oh, that other person is, is trustworthy. Okay. All right. Let's take one more, one more pass at it. Hannah? Yeah, I think it makes me think about all of the convoluted and complicated relationships that we've been looking at this whole time. And that this is a testament to how community is built, that it's messy and it's complicated. It's a little bit like coalition building if you're in the justice world or in politics, that it's messy. Like you have people who kind of end up in this Venn diagram middle space that aren't quite the thing that you are, but they mostly are, or this value is similar, but this one's different, but that that's part of building a relationship and that's part of building community and that's what mm -hmm. all of this is for and that in the end you know because you've worked so hard in these messy spaces to navigate how to exist with these other people that when push comes to shove and someone asks you you can offer up someone else who you know so deeply because you've had to do the hard work of navigating these spaces that are mm -hmm. uncomfortable for everyone and whoever has done that grace, graciously and gracefully with you and whoever you have trusted interpersonally to do that are people who you would really honor in those moments. And that it's a testament to this kind of messy, seemingly messy system that it actually allows space for people to really know each other. Okay, all right, thanks for giving us that, that big full, full picture because I, I think Hannah's right. We're talking about constructing a community we're just a whole social order here, right? In talking about trustworthiness, we are inevitably talking about other people. There's no, there's nothing, there's no trustworthiness if there's no one to trust you. Right? We're talking about developing relationships. And, you know, we can speak about trustworthiness in terms of practices and what you do and what standards you hold to, but in the end, none of that matters if other people don't recognize you as trustworthy. Like you have to exist within a community and have other people that say that, that person. And, and let me just say one last thing, which is that it is a very deep and beautiful thing to me, just on a, you know, on a very simple level that we trust someone to say good things about someone else. That we, that if someone, our baseline assumption, if you tell me that someone else is a, an incredible person. My baseline assumption is that you're speaking the truth. When we say good things about one another, that's probably coming from a good place. That says something really beautiful, maybe not about ourselves, but about other people. When we, if you, if you hear someone saying, wow, 
she's really amazing. You can believe that because people don't just praise, you know, people don't support, people don't vouch for baselessly. And I don't know if that's true, but it's a beautiful notion to, to, for the rabbis to be, to be operating with. Okay, I think that's, uh, I think we're over time for today. Thanks everybody for being here. And uh, we will uh, gather again Wednesday evening for biblical poetry um, if you care to join us. See y'all.